Hi everyone, it's Foxy, your hostess with the mostest, and today we're talking about self-identification. Foxtails presents Transitioning with Self-Identification. Okay, I know I promised some other vids and they're coming. Scripts are done for my vid on Star Trek Voyager and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and I'm working on producing them. They're both challenging full crew productions, so soon. Um, things have been busy. In the meantime, I put together a more personal essay on gender transition and how it works with the system of self-ID. I hope you enjoy. I have been thinking over how to approach this topic for a while because approaches to transgender care are improving rapidly in some parts of the world. In others, care is being made as inaccessible and frustrating as possible. My experience is an example of what patient-centered trans care can, and in my opinion, should look like. I mean, should look better, but we're getting there. To get a clear picture of where we've been and where we're going, let's start with a short history discussion. WPATH and the DSM. The World Professional Association for Transgender Health Standards of Care Guidelines have been around for a while and have gone through a number of revisions over the last decade and they're undergoing another one right now. Um, it's vastly improved from where it was 20 years ago. Uh, the standards of care for trans people have improved significantly in this framework, uh, with more emphasis put on informed consent, acknowledging non-binary transitioners, and supporting individual transition goals. But even the new language they are proposing is problematic in some areas, particularly regarding how much psychiatric evaluation youth need to undergo to access gender-affirming care. The most recent standards of care were released in 2011, with an update currently underway. These were important developments because, for the longest time, deviant gender identity and sexual orientation with was pathologized by the medical profession. In particular, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or DSM. When I was growing up, gender dysphoria was first considered transsexualism and then gender identity disorder, both of which still pathologized people of transgender identity as disordered, um, as opposed to a valid identity in the range of normal human expression. This didn't change until the DSM-5 in 2013, well after I realized I was trans, and if you knew me like a decade or so ago, you'd know I was extremely reluctant to see a medical doctor for any reason, let alone a psychologist, to convince them I was who I said I was. By the time the medical profession finished deciding that I wasn't disordered for being queer and trans, I was living in Japan, learning about gender as a spectrum, and making shit posts like this on Imager. Let's take a trip down memory lane. <laughs> Sometimes when I watch porn, I fantasize that I'm the girl. It just looks like so much fun. Let's look at the comments. No, don't do it, Fox. Never look at the comments. I'm a guy. <laughs> Survey says that was a lie. It's uncommon, but not especially unusual. It might be a sign you are, to a certain degree, bisexual. <laughs> yeah. Uh, There's nothing stopping you from giving it a shot. Try everything once. If you like it, try it twice. <laughs> well, I don't really want to go through a reassignment, so I'll just have to stick with fantasizing for now. Well, I meant, like, either getting a girl to peg you or getting with a guy. I'm bisexual myself, but I don't really like receiving personally. Yeah, I know. Don't mind receiving, but it's more like I want to be pretty with the makeup and nails and have a vagina. <sighs> ah. My mouth is writing checks. My body is very reluctant to cash. <laughs> 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 
In light of this wonderful example of how to use internet posts as historical sources, we can clearly see that a significant portion of my discomfort around transition had to do with the process as laid out in the WIPAT standards of care and the pathologization of transness in the DSM and throughout the medical profession. It'd still be a few years before I decided to transition due to poverty, conservative employers, and interpersonal relationships. But as Bob Dylan once sang, times they are a changing. Self ID and anti discrimination legislation. I live in a very progressive part of a reasonably progressive country. I say that with a huge asterisk, given Canada's behavior, first as a colonizer, then as an extraction based settler state. However, Canadians tend to be relatively progressive when it comes to the politics of tolerance and respecting individuals. People in my part of it tend to be even more so than the baseline. In 2017, Canada adopted legislation that added gender identity and expression to protected groups under the anti-discrimination articles in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. In 2018, Vancouver City Council voted unanimously to ban conversion therapy for anyone of any age in the city. Canada has followed suit federally, though imperfectly if trans legal scholars are to be understood. They damn well should be. Best practices within gender-affirming care were updated in several provinces, including Ontario and British Columbia to include self-identification as the basis for being trans and offering care based on the idea that trans people are who they say they are. My transition journey. I began my transition in late 2018 and started looking into HRT during the summer of 2019. I'd heard that the wait times to see a specialist through Vancouver's Three Bridges Clinic were about six months. So I kind of had that timeline in mind when I called to make an intake appointment. I got an intake appointment scheduled 10 days after my initial phone call. Uh, this would have been in late July and I was apprehensive in the lead up. Did a lot of thinking about what I would say, how convincing I'd have to be. Um, I would read and watched numerous trans people talk about their experiences with medical gatekeeping, um, and was absolutely not prepared for how smoothly the process went. The intake nurse reassured me that there was no one way to be trans, laughed at my jokes, and informed me that it was a six month wait to see a doctor at their clinic, but that she'd see if there was a primary care clinic closer to my home that could take me sooner. She did so immediately and my follow up appointment was made for five days later. In less than 20 days, I went from my first contact with the trans medical system to seeing a doctor willing to prescribe HRT. Compare that with the six year wait lists that pace people in the UK or places that, where transition is functionally impossible due to lack of access, gatekeeping and social conditions. My doctor's appointment was still awkward as fuck. The doc was a younger cis guy who was more worried about getting me on prep than he was about HRT, um, but said, what do you need? You probably know more about this from me. And we went from there. My access to care hasn't been perfect, uh, but that's more due to the pandemic and relative poverty. It's hard to get in-person appointments and I'm still going through a primary care clinic rather than a family doctor or endocrinologist but the system as a whole has been affirming and supportive. It's pretty great. And like I said, it should be like this everywhere. To the people watching this and thinking 20 days, that's a little quick for such a major decision. I'll remind you that I spent 10 years prior researching and pondering the question before I decided to medically transition. Even if I hadn't gone in with so much preparation, who cares? Rapid access to gender affirming care and HRT can be a life saving intervention in many cases. So I can do it. Not only that, I can assure you that most people who decide to start on hormone replacement therapy, both men and women, can tell pretty quickly if it's right for them. 
like clouds parting to the sound of a heavenly chorus. If it's not right for somebody, it's easy to stop before any significant changes occur. This is safe, reliable medical science. It's not that hard to give people access and respectfully guide them through the process. The single most disruptive element of my transition has been COVID. I mentioned that the old transition guidelines that I was trying to avoid were like, go into hiding a couple years, change towns, come out somewhere else, fully transitioned. And the massive irony is that is almost exactly what happened anyhow. Um, I got let go from work because of COVID, moved twice in search of stable housing, the same region, but basically the same town, and basically hung out in a basement for the first 18 months of HRT. Once I got vaxxed and was cut off EI, I found myself a job bartending at a giant video arcade, appropriate venue for a trans girl in a cyberpunk dystopia, and just showed up using exclusively female pronouns and plumbing and no one has said shit about it because they don't care, and if they did, they can't because they're legally required to respect my gender identity. In reality, however, it is less to do with the fact that people are legally mandated to respect me than it is that the decades of activism, public advocacy, and queer visibility in the region and across the country by LGBTQ plus folk and our allies have paid off. People just accept that I am the woman I say I am. Like, don't get me wrong, it's definitely satisfying to see stuff like a bigoted business owner having to pay an employee 30 grand because they couldn't respect that person's gender identity. But it's way better to just not be discriminated against in the first place. Privilege check. A major question that came up while writing this essay was, has my transition been a lot smoother than my peers elsewhere because society has improved or because I enjoy a significant amount of privilege? And the answer to that question is both, and it's hard to tell them apart sometimes. I'm a white settler, classically attractive, fit, well-spoken, educated, a confident self-advocate, and I come from an upper middle class family in one of the most progressive regions for LGBT, queer, two-spirit, and acero folks on the planet. Transition has absolutely closed some doors to me, uh, but others were opened and by and large, it's been a net positive. Even though I don't have access to anywhere near the same level of wealth privilege I enjoyed growing up, most of my medical transition costs have been mitigated by universal healthcare and BC's Fair Pharma program. I still have to cover the costs of lots of cosmetic stuff, cosmetic stuff, like hair removal and outpatient care if I choose to undergo any surgical procedures, uh, but GRS and breast augmentation are covered under our healthcare system, so that's cool. More importantly, I haven't lost any meaningful social or professional relationships and have gained a whole bunch of new ones. I've faced little, um, virtually zero bigotry in my real life. Uh, the little I have faced has mostly been from anonymous people on the internet. I've been extremely lucky. Um, and a big reason is because I enjoy privilege based in unjust hierarchies. Uh, and to unravel that is a project far beyond the scope of this essay. But also, we can honor the sacrifice of so many queer and racialized people before us who have cultivated normative communities that value acceptance and are learning to celebrate different ways of living. That is a legacy that we can spread and grow so people everywhere can benefit from it. Centering trans and gender nonconforming care, medical and otherwise, around a self-ID model is a concrete way we can confront bigotry and help to build more inclusive, resilient communities that are better equipped to tackle other axes of oppression. Conclusion. <laughs> I mentioned at the beginning of this essay that I wanted to use my case to talk about the potential for transition to be supported and accepted because I see a lot of narratives justifiably rooted in trauma. 
I don't have a lot of transition related trauma, which is exceedingly rare for trans folk. And I hesitate to talk about that because I don't want people to feel like I'm hand waving away their struggles like, oh, my transition was no big deal. What are you complaining about? I am painfully well aware of the conditions facing most trans and gender nonconforming people out there, um, including many people close to me. I really feel like people need to hear stories like this to know that this level of care exists and that outcomes can be extremely positive. My transition narrative should be the norm, not decades of suffering and doubt. It's a narrative worth fighting for. A lot of trans and non-binary folks are still terrified to come out and seek transition-related care because they hear and read the narratives about medical gatekeeping and aggressive transphobia and the turf wars and wait lists and estranged families. And that makes me super sad because no one should be in a situation where they have to live an inauthentic life out of fear. <sighs> Self-identified, gender-affirming care can and should be easy and accessible. The world will not collapse if we have this. If anything, it will be a brighter, queerer, more joyful place. Thanks for watching, folks. I hope you enjoyed me talking about myself again. <laughs> I've been up to lots of stuff behind the scenes and in other mediums, so I've got lots to tell you about if you want to hang out for just another minute or two. The punk sci-fi anthology I put together last year with a couple of good friends has been a huge success. Um, you can find copies of Rumble and Grow Volume 1 on Amazon links below as an ebook or in paperback and hardcover like this copy. Um, it'd be great if we could sell some more copies so I could actually pay my fellow writers a decent amount of money. Um, and myself, that would be fantastic. Um, I'm also excited to announce that there are going to be several more short story anthologies coming this year. I'll release more details soon, but in addition to some more sci-fi, we're doing a volume two, uh, we'll have some sexy gothic horror coming your way as well. Um, if you want to help support the show, the best way you can do that is by becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash foxtails. Patrons have access to a monthly newsletter where I talk in more detail about projects in progress um, and what I've been reading and what I think about what I've been reading and watching. Um, as well as finished feature film and TV scripts that I write for my professional portfolio, um, some behind the scenes on Foxtails vids, and my undying gratitude, uh, as well as some other perks that you'll find on that website. If you're the type of person who prefers one-time donations, that's great too, and I happily accept tips at www.coffee.com slash foxtails. Thanks for tuning in. Y'all have a great day, and I'll see you next time.